Welcome to episode 290 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on July 8th, 2022. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss the topic or recent news and how it relates to you. In this episode, we cover a few minor updates around Power IB parameters and Azure Monitor, and then dive into a listener question around going from a Microsoft 365 admin to a Microsoft 365 MSP or consultant, as well as dive a little bit into our opinion on how we view the differences between MSPs and consultants. We're back in Discord. It has been a long time since we have gone to Discord due to vacations <laughs> and odd recording schedules due to summer. Yes, well, I'm going to blame you, but then you're going to blame me and then we'll blame each other. It'll be fine. We're back on track now. But after all that, we didn't even... Well, you can blame me for last month. We didn't even miss a step, though. You've still had them coming out every week. You're, you're doing good. We are. We have managed to record at some odd times, record one on vacation... We did have a few recorded that were saved up. So I don't believe, Scott, to give both of us a pat on the back, that in three years, three and a half years, has it been three and a half years now? 289 divided by 50? Has it been five years? We're on 290 today, yeah. Has it really been five years? In five years, I don't believe we have ever missed releasing a new episode. Not yet, but don't jinx it. (laughs) Well... (laughs) I won't. I just did. Too late. All right. Well, let's get into this one and at least get this out the door. So we had a few requests come in on the Discord general channel, Scott. And one of them was to talk about Viva. But (laughs) we don't talk about Viva. We don't talk about Viva. I mean, we could talk about Viva at some point. I'm not a fan of the whole licensing construct thing. And, you know, we name everything Viva or everything Purview or everything Entra, those kinds of things. So I think we can talk about parts of Viva. That's easy enough. But Viva sales, not my jam. If it's yours, we can totally get into it. But I will try Viva sales primarily because I do have some CRM type stuff because of consulting and having my own company. The Viva sales intrigues me more than maybe like Viva Learning or Viva Insights or what are the other ones in there? Yeah, Some of those other ones, especially if it can be like a little bit more of a lightweight CRM or built-in, it'll also be interesting to see how Viva sales shakes out with dynamics and all that. But for now, we don't talk about Viva, Bruno, or... The weather. I don't know. We can talk sometime about that one time I built a CRM on top of Azure DevOps, and Azure DevOps is not a great CRM system. That is neither here nor there. I so desperately want to hear about why you would even think to try to build a CRM on top of Azure DevOps. Because things. Maybe, Maybe someday we'll get into that one. So before we get into today's listeners' suggested topic, I wanted to kind of real quick run through a few things. So in the past, uh, I I think it was last month or so, we briefly talked about field parameters in Power BI and this capability that lets you introduce some dynamicism around the axes in your charts. So say you had a bar chart and you wanted to have a dynamic Y axis based on you know the category a product is sold in, maybe the subcategory, the region, things like that. And traditionally in Power BI that's really hard to do because you have to have separate visuals, you might show them and hide them with a button, like you can't make it super simple in just a slicer. So I probably did a really poor job explaining that last time, and I'm probably doing a really poor job explaining it now. But the gentleman behind Guy in a Cube on YouTube, they went and put a video together that actually shows how to use field parameters for both a dynamic X and Y axes on a Power BI visual, such as a bar chart. So I'm going to put a link in the show notes so everybody can go see that. It's really quick. It's a three-minute video. I've been playing around with the field parameters more and more in Power BI. 
And they're super nifty, uh, super powerful. Like I found myself using them all over the place. And that's probably just because it's some like new tool in the toolbox and, and I'm kind of all about it right now. But if you're looking at that and you're going like, and, and you watch that video and you say, Hey, this is something that I'd be interested in doing. You can totally go check it out. It's in the latest versions of Power BI Desktop. You just have to make sure that you turn on the experimental features, like the preview features of which field parameters is one of those. But once you go ahead and, and light it up, it is super easy to get on board with. So that was number one. Number two is around Azure Monitor and monitoring agents on virtual machines and kind of how all of that comes together inside of Azure today. So there's an existing agent, like if, you're, if you've been deploying agents all along, you've probably been just deploying the regular OMS agent that comes out of Log Analytics. So that gives you this integration to pump telemetry that you've configured in your Log Analytics workspace up from N clients, could be like an art client, an on-prem client, could be a server in Azure, whatever it happens to be, but you want to collect some type of telemetry so you can observe behavior on those virtual machines or, I guess, machines that are monitored by that agent. So that agent, the OMS agent, is deprecated. Like it's gonna go away in, I believe, August 2024. It's going away in a couple of years. It's been announced that hey, this isn't the path forward, and all the monitoring agents are going in a different direction. That's a little hard to do today. Like migration is manual today. You have to figure out which machines are using the older agent. You have to go and say, like, okay, you're using the older agent, and then what was the configuration that was in effect? on that agent. So the OMS agents, they read their configuration out of a log analytics workspace. The new agent doesn't read its configuration out of a log analytics workspace. So it's kind of a totally different system between the two. So the first thing that's out in preview is a migration workbook. It's called the Migration Helper. So if you're familiar with Azure Monitor workbooks, there is a now a workspace a workspace based solution that you can use inside of Azure Monitor, and that's going to show you which servers, clients in your environment are using the OMS agent or, or the legacy agent. And then as you migrate them, it will show you that, hey, you know, this agent moved from here to here. So you can get just a nice graphical overview of what's happening with agent health in your environment across both sets of agents, not having to look at just like the Azure Monitor agent versus the older log analytics agent. So that's all well and that's all good. The other pain point of migration was this difference in how configuration change was affected within the agents. So like I said, the OMS agent, log analytics agent uses your log analytics workspace as kind of the source of truth for what its configuration should be. And the new agent doesn't rely on log analytics at all. It only uses these data collection rules and you kind of have to figure out how to make all that happen. So that was a manual process too, but what Microsoft has released in preview is a PowerShell script that you can run. You basically just Azure PowerShell, log into your subscription. What's the resource group that has the log analytics workspace with the configuration that you want to pull out and then give it like a local folder path so it can write those configurations locally to your disk. It goes ahead, it reads the rules out of your log analytics workspace and then it expresses those as data collection rule JSON. So data collection rules, just DCR. So you end up with all this DCR JSON that then you can take and you can run that directly into things like maybe your ARM templates and go ahead and spin things up that way. Super cool, super nifty. Seems to pull most things out like in the 20, 30 minutes I spent playing around with it. It's all in preview today, but it, it seems, like I said, for the most part, pretty solid and pretty straightforward. So I'd encourage anybody who is using the OMS agent today to go back and kind of have a look at some of these new preview features and some of the documentation that's been released about it. Because while it is years away, you're probably going to want to start thinking about it today and then get that kind of 
change implemented over the next year or so here. So you're not running into it at the very end of time. I'm assuming as you do this migration that it's a change in the agent, a change in how that config is generated, but it still is going to pump the exact same data into the exact same log analytics instance into Azure Monitor. So you could run them in parallel, have some VMs in the old one, some VMs in the new one, and you're not going to lose any of that analytics data that's coming into Azure Monitor. Yeah, you're just doing a swing. So uh, yeah, go, go from A to B. Make sure your configuration is the same, if not similar. You know, Maybe you want to update those things now. Maybe you've decided that, well, I don't know, Like I, I think I ran into this one a lot. Oh my gosh, log analytics is too expensive. We're logging too much. Well, let's take <laughs> this as an opportunity to, to maybe log less stuff or log more stuff. Like Maybe you like to give Microsoft money. I don't know. Whichever way you want to go with it. Right. If you want to log more stuff, let me know and let me put my uh, partner ID on your partner record. And I will gladly put that in there and let you log more stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there we go. Uh, more attribution for Ben. Exactly. You got it. Nifty, I'm going to have to go look at that because I know I have some clients I've worked with that are on the old OMS agent. And I looked at that at one point in time too in terms of like starting to swing to the new one. And there wasn't a super straightforward approach. So having some of these migration tools, these scripts to be able to get closer easier is going to come in very handy. I think like having the workbook that shows you both is a nicety. So you could certainly go out to something like a log analytics workspace today and run queries against that workspace to figure out, hey, what machines are connected to this workspace right now? Are they Windows, Linux, blah, 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 all that good stuff. But having that just in like a nice, quick, like out-of-the-box workbook, spin it all up, put it in front of you, Great, I understand my estate. Here's where I need to go focus my time. And then you can kind of focus your time over there. And if you're just using like the same configuration and you're one log analytics workspace kind of thing, or even if you're multiple workspaces with the same configuration, anything like that, like hopefully it makes that transition to DCR even that much easier for you. Yeah, very cool. More stuff to go figure out. My list, Scott, my ever growing list. No, this is what I'm going to have to do because I definitely have some instances where we're going to have to think about switching in the next few years. Indeed. So are you ready for our off-topic topic? I am absolutely ready for our off-topic topic. But we're missing Torg, who actually brought up this off-topic topic. He is MIA today for the live show. He'll catch it on the recording. He can listen to it. You still got to do it. Exactly. Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to manage your Office 365 environment? Are you facing unexpected issues that disrupt your company's productivity? Intelligent is here to help. Much like you take your car to the mechanic that has specialized knowledge on how to best keep your car running, Intelligent helps you with your Microsoft Cloud environment because that's their expertise. Intelligent keeps up with the latest updates in the Microsoft Cloud to help keep your business running smoothly and ahead of the curve. Whether you are a small organization with just a few users up to an organization of several thousand employees. They want to partner with you to implement and administer your Microsoft Cloud technology. Visit them at intellijink.com slash podcast. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-I-N-K dot com slash podcast for more information or to schedule a 30-minute call to get started with them today. Remember, Intellijink focuses on the Microsoft Cloud so you can focus on your business. All right, so our off-topic topic was, and we're going to take some freedoms here as well in how we approach this off-topic topic, but the request was moving from an M365, so Microsoft 365 admin, to a Microsoft 365 MSP, managed service provider, either working for one or starting one. One of the liberties I'm going to take here is I'm assuming moving from a Microsoft 365 admin is he is implying, what are your thoughts on going from like a full-time role? Doing Microsoft 365 admin for a company versus doing Microsoft 365 as an MSP. And I'm also going to would say... And one thing I would be interested to talk about, Scott, and even hear some of your thoughts is Microsoft 365 MSP or consultant? Because in my mind, 
there is a difference between an MSP and a consultant, even contractor, and going making that transition, I think, from more of that full-time role to that, I would say more consultant. But what was your thoughts on the phrasing of that? <laughs> I think I often hear in the back of my head, like when I think about things like this, especially for smaller sellers or individual sellers, I'm really thinking more consultative in the back of my head. So you really are talking probably about making a transition into more of a consultative role where you offer fixed services. And then within that, you probably start to adopt what are you know traditionally parts of like a managed service provider like an MSP ecosystem you might decide to go out and become a CSP like like you've done in your case so go yep. go be a CSP that allows you to be a reseller of things like Microsoft 365 or Azure you can do that as an individual you can do it as a corporation like like you know you could be one person you could be 500 people whatever that happens to be and then once you have the ability to sell those services to resell uh, services in the form of I guess SaaS services you're selling software at that point once you have the ability to resell that then you start tapping Hacking on kind of fixed value add services on top of that. So that could be everything from, hey, I'm going to have a fixed service that maybe helps you out with identity health, like monthly. Like monthly, you get a half hour check where, you know, we hop in, we make sure we've cleaned out expired guest users from your environment. We make sure that everything's looking good. Maybe it's, you know, running through some logs, things like that. Could be kind of fixed onboarding services like hey I'm a, I'm a CSP who sells Microsoft 365 maybe one of the offerings that I would have is helping you onboard identity as well so how do we configure directory synchronization like what do those packages look like and and how do I come on so I think a lot of it just comes down to you know if you're thinking about yourself individually or as a company of more than a few and then that probably frames the conversation in those different ways yeah and I think like when I hear MSP2, and this is where for me, I've started to set a distinction because I've talked to people before about, and they're like, oh, do you do MSP stuff? Or what is the difference between you and an MSP? And I've had some smaller companies even come to me that want help with Microsoft 365. But then they say, well, do you also help with desktops and printers and networking and all of that? And I think in my head, there is a difference between MSP and consulting even somewhat in the services you offer. So if somebody comes to me and says, I need help with my IT needs for my company, I will come right out and say, I will not touch a printer. I'm not going to help you with your router. I'm not going to do networking and switches and all of that. And I would say as a caveat, there may be one or two instances I've done that. But as a practice, I avoid that because and it, it ties in a little bit to what you're saying. I'm one person now getting into two or three. I have a contractor working for me, part, a couple of contractors working for me part-time. One of them might transition to full-time. But even he was like, I don't want to do MSP work. I don't want to be somebody's help desk for all of their IT stuff. And I think you run into even a little bit of a pricing there. When I look at a lot of traditional MSPs, I am more expensive than an MSP because I want to stay, I will do Microsoft 365, I will do Azure. If it touches your desktop, and the lines have started to blur a little bit for me, especially with Intune and Endpoint Management, is I will start to touch your desktop, to touch Windows, as it ties in to Microsoft 365. If there isn't a direct correlation to me for Microsoft 365, third-party software, you want to go out and run another third-party antivirus, you want to do AirPlay for MDM, I try to avoid that and stay specifically in that Microsoft 365 space. And that's where I start differentiating between MSPs and consultants, where MSPs seem to be a lot more broad in the topics they, were, they will cover. 
and not as focused. And I think because of that, because it's still some of that help desk, the support, general IT stuff, that maybe their rates also tend to be a little bit lower. And I'm just not willing to try to compete with some of those MSP rates. That's interesting. I, I think I think about it the other way. Right? Like MSPs are more constrained because you're going to have a set of fixed offerings. So here are the ways that my organization sees that it can add value on top of Microsoft 365. And then within there, you'll have a, a probably a matrices of like services. Right? So take that example of identity management. Maybe you have your own package of price per user per month and then multiple tiers yep. within there. Like, okay, I've got the basic user onboarding package, I've got standard, I've got premium, things like that. Like, it's broad, sure, in the sense that I have lots of things, but it's also still narrowly defined in the scope. It's not or oh, just an all up consultative kind of thing. You know, I tend to look at MSPs as kind of competing against them, them each other and themselves a little bit on what's that matrices of service and then how do they kind of fix cost within within how all that manifests itself, right? You know, you might be an MSP who wants to do uh, user based services. You might want to be an MSP who works, like you said, on the desktop side, like on, on the Windows side and the deployment side. Maybe you want to focus on desktop apps. Maybe you want to do all of those things. But if you do them all, then you have to be good at all of them, but you probably don't have time to be good at a lot of other things either. Like you got to be right. kind of constrained and, and jumping in there. It's a little bit of a trade off. Of saying, hey, I'm going to have these fixed services, fixed pricing, and here's the deal. And, and when you do that, really the way to scale and, and get yourself more revenue is to either offer more services, like a more diverse set of services, or onboard more users. So you end up in this weird place where you have to chase onboarding users versus consulting land where you don't necessarily have to kind of chase that much. You're really just, you're, you're being that jack of all trades, I think, that can kind of hop in and affect change and then go, okay, hey, you need the value add thing. Oh, by the way, I do that too. And here's how much it costs. Let's go. Right. So do you think there is, and I'm asking this with a little bit of experience in it, a space for like a Microsoft as this was kind of mentioned, and it actually wasn't Torg that said it, it was Moag that said this. I misspoke on the name. Torg was the Viva guy, or the Viva person. Moag was the one that asked this question. But going back to Microsoft 365, do you think there's a space for like a Microsoft 365 MSP? That narrow focus on Microsoft 365 that provides just those services around Microsoft 365 and actually does ignore the rest of them, where they say, if you want desktop support or networking support, you go find a networking MSP and a desktop MSP. So in theory, you have maybe three or four MSPs all with a narrow focus on a specific technology. Or at that point in time, are you going out and hiring consultants on all of those? Or is there actually a difference? I don't know that there's so much of a difference in, in my head, right? Like a, a lot of it comes down to your clientele and, and the size of your clientele. I could see a in my days, like when I was going out and trying to find companies to kind of do these kinds of things for the organizations that I work for, like I, you know, in a previous life, I used to run like a what was it, like a 2,000, 3,000 seat, like O365 org, and we farmed out all those services really around management. So we could focus on like architecture, business enablement, all those kinds of things. And I wanted okay. a company that managed Office 365 that also to also be the same company that managed our desktops and our network. Like that was just a, that was like a non-starter to have separate things there because I needed that alignment across the company. Like I needed to be able to pull somebody who knew the way our our networking site to site worked along with how we had our ER circuits going up to Azure, along with considerations for that site to site connectivity and how we connected to Azure and Office 365 for desktop clients. Like I just wanted to kind of pull all that together and have it there. And then I would bring in consultants for super tactical work, right? I've got this one thing that really needs to get done. Now I have time to do it myself, but it's narrowly defined in scope. I can give you a set of requirements, like, great, go off and, and build it, make that thing happen happen for me. But if I was a smaller organization and I didn't have the ability to say, hey, let me spend 
let me get what I want and spend the amount of money I need to spend to get there because I can I can justify it and I can make it happen. If you're a small yep. organization, like, hey, I run a local restaurant in town and I've got five PCs sitting in the back that I need somebody to take care of and just get them on, you probably do have a different networking person than you have from the person who's helping you out with your PCs, from the person who's maybe helping you with your Office 365 subscription. Like, There's you know more moving pieces there, but you're also probably more price conscientious and you want to be kind of super effective in where you spend your money. So you can make that kind of trade off. You can make that. Okay. So, and here's the experience I had. So I tried to do a little bit of essentially like Microsoft 365 as a service, which would kind of be like a Microsoft 365 MSP. And I did not have much luck with it because even in the 50, 30, 25 person companies I ran into, they wanted the same thing you just said. They wanted one person to do desktop, to do networking, to do email exchange and all of that. And where I have typically come into play in those companies is I actually have a relationship with several different MSPs and they will call me when they get more of those projects. They're like, you know what, this is above and beyond creating users, resetting passwords, connecting Exchange on the desktop and all of that. But we need somebody that really knows Microsoft 365, whether it's for SharePoint or for maybe calling in Teams and that type of stuff. And that's where I've tended to fit myself, at least, into the whole MSP versus consultant, is I haven't been able to compete with the MSPs or even fit in alongside of another MSP because more and more MSPs are doing the basic Microsoft 365 stuff. I mean, MSPs should be doing the basic stuff. That's what they're here for. So, you know, there's a couple of things that I think, you know, folks are interested in in this path. They can go out and, and, and research. One is, how do I become a CSP and a reseller? The other is going to be, how do I become a Microsoft partner? Like, how do I take advantage of the Microsoft partner network? What benefits are available to me there? Like, you know, a lot of this conversation actually on the partner network is spelled out pretty clearly. Like, Microsoft as a company, because I, I used to write these playbooks for Microsoft to help companies like go build their businesses on top of Azure <laughs> Microsoft 365. Uh-huh. They have this defined vision for where like the swim lanes Microsoft wants to be in as a business and where they think partners can slot into that and then various types of partners, right? Are you a consultancy? Are you going to be a straight reseller? Are you going to offer some type of services? Is that going to be like a fully managed service? Like, is that the hey, I'm going to do the per user per month pricing on top of Microsoft 365 and charge that to my customers. Is that having, I think, more kind of ad hoc service engagements out there? So maybe you have a fixed offering that's like fixed price, doesn't really matter on the number of users, maybe it does, but it just says like, hey, I'll do this, this, or this kind of thing for you. But those those are all out there, like all that IP and that help, it's already been written for you and it can certainly help you kind of rationalize potentially which path you want to go down. Some of it's a little bit probably back to like who you are as a person too. Like I know you, you you like to tinker with things, like you're happy being out on your own. Like consultant life fits you very well. Other people just like that's not what they're looking for, right? They're looking for the rote and repeatable kind of thing. So let me do that and scale through maybe number of users that I charge charge for. And I think maybe like when I hear you talk about you know having to compete with other MSPs, I don't think it's not really that you don't want to compete with other MSPs. It's that like what I hear when you say that is you don't want to constrain yourself to that fixed set of services and have to grow purely through. Through like the number of seats that you manage. That's really like the path to additional revenue there. It's probably a little bit more boring <laughs> than you know yes. what you're looking for. Yeah. And that's probably accurate. And I think to kind of go back to that question too, about even going from like an FTE, a Microsoft 365 admin, to an MSP or to a consultant. I think you I would say a skill set as a Microsoft 365 admin, if you've been doing it a while for a decent-sized company, I don't know that I would necessarily say there's a great skill set or some missing skill set that you would need to go get 
or go work on before you would go to an MSP or a consultant. If you've been doing an admin, you're probably used to talking to business users. You're probably used to troubleshooting. You may be used to helping to figure out which products to buy, which services fit where within the business. I think all of those translate to both uh, working for an MSP or starting an MSP or doing the consultant thing. And to your point, Scott, I think a lot of it is depending on who you are, what's your personality. You nailed it on the head. I would get bored doing MSP stuff. I don't want to do the same thing over and over and over again every day. I don't want to serve as a help desk. I'll go help you stand stuff up, get it working, fix it when no everybody else is beating their heads against the wall and they can't figure it out because I like to dive in and just figure that stuff out. I don't want to be creating new users or resetting passwords or trying to figure out why you can't print or why Outlook won't connect to Office 365 and doing that type of stuff. So more of that consultant-based, project-based, deployment-based fits me well. Whether you do it on your own or where you work for somebody else is also very much your personality. You and I have talked about it before when I've tried to get you to come contract with me. You tend to like having the job where you're working for somebody else, I think. Just based on your personality, what we've talked about. Personally, I don't know that I could... It would be a struggle for me to go back working for another company. So I think there's a little bit of, do you want to go out on your own versus do you want to work for somebody in your personality and what you have an appetite for as well as do you want to do the MSP type of work in... For some people, again, for me, it's boring. Some people like that stuff. They like maybe having a broader set of things or working in that type of stuff versus the project stuff. So I think a lot of it has to do more with personality than with a particular skill set when it comes from going from that admin type of role into some type of MSP or consulting-based role whether it be for yourself or for somebody else. I think it's something you can kind of try out too. Uh, This probably varies depending on the part of the world you live in, but I know here in the US, there's tons of companies today that do the remote work thing, and they also do like hourly rates for this kind of stuff. So if you were Microsoft 365 admin in your organization today, and like, huh, I wonder if consulting's for me, if being an MSP, is, like going to work for an MSP is for me, you might want to try moonlighting for a little while. If that's something that your company allows, like go work hourly for an MSP for a month and see if you like the kind of activities that they throw on you or if it's something you're potentially interested in in building a business around. Ultimately, I like I think the whole thing like MSP versus consultant, like it comes down to how much flexibility you want in not just in how your day-to-day is kind of structured, but in the activities that you do day to day. You're probably not going out as an MSP and helping a customer one day build a new Power BI report and then the next day working on build pipelines in Azure. Like that's just not happening, but it could easily happen yep. in consultant land. Oh yes, absolutely. It's happened to me multiple days. For one day I'm working on an Azure migration and the next day I'm working on DLP policies in Microsoft 365. So, and I would definitely agree with trying it out. That's actually one of the contractors I have working for me. That's what he's doing. He still has a full-time job. He is okay to do some moonlighting. He's been doing a little contract work for me on the side to help him figure out what he likes and what direction he wants to go. So if you do have that opportunity, like Scott said, definitely give that a shot. No matter what, like look into reseller programs. Like I think that's a no-brainer for just about anybody. Look into yep. things like partner networks and the benefits that come with that. I think those are like just must-haves. Like you must do those things, whether you're going out on your own or even if you're gonna go work for like another company, like, hey, are you a Microsoft partner? What type of partner are you? What level do you maintain? What benefits does that give me as an employee? Those kinds of things. Yep. There's some nice stuff there. And I do. I'm a silver partner in a couple different competencies. Um, So I've been doing the silver partnership thing for two or three years now. And also doing the CSP and reselling Azure and Microsoft 365. And I would agree. Go do those. There are a couple nice things to do. So with that, Scott, I think we can probably wrap it up for the day. Sure. You look like you have way better weather there. Is it actually sunny by you? Sorry, side topic, squirrel. My key light's that bright. Oh, okay. 
We have a downpour here. I think there's like cars floating down the road or something. It's getting darker. So, All right. Well, go enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend, Scott. And if you do have any other questions, if you'd like us to discuss topics such as this or other Microsoft 365 Azure topics in a future episode, let us know on Twitter. Reach out to us at, at MS Cloud IT Pro or through the MS Cloud IT Pro members at Discord. And you can get access to that by signing up for monthly membership. And that'll give you access to Discord for chatting, for participating live in the show as we record each week. And you also get access to our To The Cloud streams on YouTube where we haven't done this in a while, but hopefully in the next week or two, Scott, will get back to diving into configuring and using various features and services across Azure and Microsoft 365. If you do want to sign up for that... Yeah, I'm going to put you on the hook. You said we're going to do... We're going to do Azure AD to Microsoft Graph PowerShell. Okay. Azure AD to Microsoft 365 Graph PowerShell in the next one of those. If you do want to sign up for membership and watch that live, get access to that, go to mscloudITPro.com slash membership. Thanks to everyone that has supported the show thus far, as well as to our sponsor, Intelligent. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.